Valor Magulish, you fucking bastard, yes. Welcome back to fucking Pints of Ice and Fire, the series in which I and the extra read to you from George R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, okay? Uh, fucking, obviously, it's Pints of Ice and Fire because I'll be drinking pint, a pint while reading from uh, George R. Martin's masterwork, right? Now, guys, fucking, what's going to be happening uh, this week? What chapter I'm going to be reading to you is uh, the prologue from A Game of Thrones. That's right, I'm going right back to the fucking start. Now, this series is all about my favourite chapters. Um, so, last week, or last time I brought you the parlay from Storm's End between Renly and Stannis. Fucking awesome, right? Uh, before that, uh, one of Victorian Greyjoy's chapters from uh, A Dance of Dragons um, and the reason why I'm doing the prologue from A Game of Thrones is because this is when at the age of 13, uh, I'm 36 now, <laughs> at the age of 13 I got hooked on this story. Um, my brother had come in and I had really savage dyslexia when I was younger so my brother read me The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings I just couldn't fucking read them but um, Whenever I got that bit older then, you know, around the age of 13, he came out and I read the prologue to this. And I, I was blown away by it. Just the supernatural element will always get me, you know. So it was kick-ass. I mean, like, from Lord of the Rings, I love fucking shit like the Witch King of Angmar and, you know, fucking the, the, the dark side of the whole fucking thing. Mor reading about Morgoth and all this type of shit. I'm all into that, I think. That's human nature that you do, but you know, that's why motherfuckers love Darth Vader. Do you know what I mean? So like, the others, as they're referred to more in the book, they are called White Walkers in the book at times, but definitely the others, it's the appearance of the others um, through the forest, it's fucking brilliant. So, right, I'm not gonna beat around the bush here. First of all, what I'm gonna do, is I'm going to fucking uh, pour my pint because if I don't pour the pint then it's not pints of ice and fire don't fucking bubble over thank you oh shit here it goes always always right now check this out and boom right so the instruction every time. Listen, if you're not drinking Guinness out of a Guinness glass and you're not drinking fucking Guinness, and that's just the the long and short of it all. And it goes, keep it nice and close, right? And the last drops go on and form the head. Now, guys, as you know, um, I'm covering a song of ice and fire, but don't forget that you can go over and check out Bobby Marno reading fucking uh, <laughs> fighting his way through uh, uh, fire and blood. Don't rem uh, don't forget that you can uh, listen to uh, Bobby's audiobooks on that as well, right? But I'm going to cover um, a song of ice and fire while drinking pints, a lot less formally than Bobby is. But there we go. Okay. Now, um, so what I'm going to do, guys, is just you know that I, I make an attempt at the voices, fucking, you know. Um, because it's fucking fun for me, all right? Plain and simple. It's fucking fun. That's why I do it, right? So here we go. <coughs> here we go, Andrew. Nice. Clear diction is, is key here. All right. Okay, so prologue, game of, a Game of Thrones. We join, sorry, we join Will uh, Garrett, uh, two rangers, out of the Night's Watch guard being the more seasoned one will um, still be in a full blown ranger but not as seasoned as guard and then Sir Waymar Royce who's a, a high born bitch you know uh, who's not been in the watch that long but because of his high born status is, this has even in the Night's Watch has um, enabled him to fucking fire up our ranks but he's a bitch even though he's a knight it's a bitch, right? <clears throat> Here we go. Here's my guard, right? Check it out. 
We should stop back, Garrett urged as the woods began to grow dark around them. The wildlings are dead. Do the dead frag you? Sir Waymar, Sir Waymar Royce asked with just the hint of a smile. Garrett did not rise to the bait. He was an old man past fifty and he had seen the lordlings come and go. Dead is dead, he said. We have no business with the dead. Are they dead? Royce asked softly. What proof have we? Will sold him, Garrett said. If he says they are dead, that's proof enough for me. Will had known they would drag him into the quarrel sooner or later. He wished it had been later rather than sooner. Well, my mother told me that dead men sing no songs, he put in. My wet nurse said the same thing, Will, Royce replied. Never believe anything you hear at a woman's tit. There are things to be learned even from the dead. His voice echoed too loud in the twilight forest. That's my pain settled. Fuck. Right. <clears throat> we have a long ride before us, Garrett pointed out. Eight days, maybe nine, and night is falling. Sir Waymar Royce glanced at the sky with disinterest. It does that every day, about this time. Are you unmanned by the dark, Garrett? Will could see the tightness around Garrett's mouth. The barely suppressed anger in his eyes under the thick black hood of his cloak. Garrett had spent 40 years in the Night's Watch, man and boy, and he was not accustomed to being made light of. Yet it was more than that. Under the wounded pride, Will could sense something else in the older man. You could taste it. A nervous tension that came perilously close to fear. Will shared his unease. He had been four years on the wall. The first time he had been sent beyond, all the, all the old stories had come rushing back and his bowels had turned to water. He had laughed about it afterwards. He was a veteran of a hundred rangings by now in the endless dark wilderness that the Southern called the Haunted Forest had no more terrors for him. Until tonight. Something was different. There was an edge to this darkness that made his hackles rise. Nine days they had been riding north and northwest and then north again, farther and farther from the wall, hard on the track of a band of wildling raiders. Each day had been worse than the day that had came before it. Today was the worst of all. A cold wind was blowing out of the north and it made the trees r rustle like living things. All day Will had felt as though something, something were watching him, something cold and unplaceable that loved him not. Garrett had felt it too. Will wanted nothing so much as to ride hell-bent for the safety of the wall, but that was not a feeling to share with your commander. Especially not a, not a commander like this one. Sir Waymar Royce was the youngest son of an ancient house with too many heirs. He was a handsome youth of eighteen, grey-eyed and graceful and slender as a knife. Mounted on his huge black destrier, the knight towered above Will and Garrett on their smaller garments. He wore black leather boots, black woolen pants, black moleskin gloves and a fine supple coat of gleaming black ringmail over layers of black wool and boiled leather. Sir Waymar had been a sworn brother of the Night's Watch for less than a year, but no one could say he had not prepared for his vocation, at least insofar as, as his wardrobe was concerned. His cloak was his, clo <coughs> his cloak was his crowning glory, sable thick and black and soft as sin. But he killed him all himself, he did, Garrett told the barracks over wine. Twisted their little heads off, a mighty warrior. They had all shared the laugh. It is hard to take orders from a man you laughed at in your cups. Will reflected as he sat shivering atop his garden. Garrett must have felt the same. Mormon said we should track them, and we did, 
Garrod said. They're dead. They shan't trouble us no more. There's hard riding before us. I don't like this weather. If it snows, we could be a fortnight getting back and the snow's the best we can hope for. Ever seen an ice storm, my lord? The lordlings seemed not to hear him. He studied the deepening twilight in that half-bored, half-distracted way he had. Will had ridden with the night long enough to understand that it was best not to interrupt him when he looked like that. Tell me again what you saw, Will. All the details. Leave nothing out. Will had been a hunter before he joined the Night's Watch. Well, a poacher in truth. Malister free riders had caught him red-handed in the Mal Malister's own woods, skinning one of Malister's own bucks, and it had been a, and it had been a choice of putting on the black or losing a hand. No one could move through the woods as silent as Will, and it had not been and it and it had not taken the Black Brothers long to discover his talent. The camp is two miles farther on. Over that ridge, hard beside a stream, Will said. Well, I got as close as I did. There's eight of them, men and women both. No children I could see. They put up a lean-to against the rock. The snow's pretty well covered it now, but I could still make it out. No fire burning, but the fire pit was still plain as day. No one moving. I watched for a long time. No living man ever lay so still. Did you see any blood? Well, no. Did you see any weapons? S some swords, a, a few bows. One man had an axe. Heavily, heavy looking, double bladed, a, a cruel piece of iron. It was on the ground beside him, right by his end. Did you make note of the position of the bodies? Well shrugged. A couple are sitting up against the rock, most of them on the ground, falling like. Or sleeping, Rice suggested. Falling, Will insisted. There's one woman up an ironwood, half hid in the branches, a far ice. He smiled thinly. I, I took care she I took care she never saw me. When I got closer, I saw that she wasn't moving neither. Despite himself, he shivered. You have a chill? Rice asked. Or oh, some, Will muttered. Some, Will muttered. The wind, my lord. The young knight turned, turned back to his grizzled man-at-arms. Frost-falling leaves whispered past them and Rice's destrier moved restlessly. Hmm, what do you think might have killed these men guarded? Sir Waymar asked casually. He adjusted the drape of his long sable cloak. It was the cold, Garrod said with iron certainty. I saw men freeze last winter, and the one before, when I was half a boy. Everyone talks about snows forty foot deep and how the ice wind came howling out of the north. But the right, real enemy is the cold. It steals up in you quieter than will. And at first you shiver and your teeth chatter. And you, and you stamp your feet and dream of mulled wine and nice hot fires. It burns, it does. Nothing burns like the cold. But only for a while. Then it gets inside you. It starts to fill you up. And after a while you don't have the strength to fight it. It's easy to just sit down or go to sleep. They say you don't feel pain toward the end. First you go weak and drowsy, and everything starts to fade. And then it's like sinking into a sea of warm milk. Peaceful like. Such eloquence, Garrett, Sir Waymar observed. I never suspected you had it in you. I've the cold in me too, Lordling. Garrett pulled back his hood, giving Sir Waymar a good look. A good long look at the stumps where his ears had been. Two ears, three toes, and a little finger off my left hand. I got off light. We found my brother frozen at his watch with a smile on his face. 
Sir Waymar shrugged. You, had, <clears throat> you ought to dress more warmly, Garrod. Garrod glared at the lordling. The scars around his ear holes flushed red with anger where Master Eamon had cut his ears away. We'll see how warm you can dress when the winter comes. He pulled up his hood and hunched over his garn, silent and sullen. Wow, Royce is a prick. <clears throat> if Gar had said it was cold, Will began. Have you drawn any watches this past week, Will? Oh, yes, my lord. There, were, <clears throat> there never was a week when he did not draw a dozen bloody watches. What was the man driving at? And how did you find the wall? Weeping, Will said, frowning. He said it clear enough now that the lordling had pointed it. He, he saw it clear enough now that the lordling had pointed it out. Oh, they couldn't have froze, not if the wall was weeping. It wasn't cold enough. Royce nodded. Bright lad, we've had a few light frosts this past week and a quick flurry of snow now and then, but surely no cold fierce enough to kill eight grown men, men clad in fur and leather. Let me remind you with shelter near at hand and the means of making fire. The knight's smile was cocksure. Will, lead us there. I would see these dead men for myself. And then there was nothing to be done for it. The order had been given, and honour bound them to obey. Will went in front, his shaggy little garn picking, picking the way carefully through the undergrowth. A light snow had fallen the night before, and there were stones and roots and hidden sinks lying just under its crust, waiting for the careless and the unwary. Sir Waymar Royce came next, his great black destrier snorting impatiently. The war horse was the wrong mount for ranging, but try telling that to the lordling. Uh, destriers are usually more used in the tournaments and shit, um, war and stuff. They're not a fucking ranging horse. So, and he's taking that because it's bigger than theirs. Because he's a prick. Because he's a dickhead. Bringing the wrong equipment with you on an expedition, my god. Like the wrong horse. Or fucking dickhead, right? <clears throat> right, yeah. See, most of the lords of Westeros are bourgeois as fuck. Fucking man, they're dicks. Right, <clears throat> let me see. Let me see when we be. Yeah, uh, Garrod. Garrod brought up the rear. The old man at arms muttered to himself as he rode. Twilight deepened. The cloudless sky turned a deep pur purple. Good band. The colour of an old bruise then faded to black. The stars began to come out. A half moon rose. Will was grateful for the light. <sighs> we can make a better pace than this, surely, Royce said when the moon was when the moon was full risen. Not with this horse, Will said. Fear had made him insolent. Perhaps my lord would care to take the lead. Sir Waymar Royce did not ding, dang. <coughs> Fuck that word, man. Dean. Sir Waymar Royce did not deign a reply. Somewhere off in the wood, a wolf howled. Imagine, that's fucking so fucked up, man. You're travelling by night now and you'll barely see anything up through the snow and there's wolves howling and shit. Right? Will pulled his garn over beneath an ancient gnarled ironwood and dismounted. Why are you stopping? Sir Waymar, Sir Waymar asked. Oh, best to go the rest of the way on foot, my lord. Just over that ridge. Royce paused a moment, staring off in the distance, his face reflective. A cold wind whispered through the trees. His great sable cloak stirred behind like some something half alive. There's something wrong here, Garrod muttered. Ooh, fuck. 
The young knight gave him a disdainful smile. Is there? Can you feel it? Garrett asked. Listen to the darkness. Will could feel it. Four years in the night's watch and he had never been so afraid. What was it? Wind, trees rustling, a wolf. Which sound is it that unmans you so, Garrett? When Garrett did not answer, Royce slid graceful, gracefully from his saddle. He tied the destrier securely to a low-hanging limb, well away from the other horses, and drew his long sword from its sheath. Jewels glittered in its hilt, and the moonlight ran down the shining steel. It was a splendid weapon, castle forged, <clears throat> and made a <laughs> new made from the look of it. Well doubted it, well doubted, well doubted it had it ever been swung, which it's true, if I could fucking say the word. Will doubted it had ever been swung in anger. Right. The trees press <coughs> the trees press close here, Will warned. That sword will tangle up, my lord. Better a knife. If I need instructions I will ask for it, the young lord said. Garrett, stay here, guard the horses. Garrett dismounted. We need a fire. I'll see to it. How big how big a fool are you, old man? If there are enemies in this wood, a fire is the last thing we want. There's some enemies a fire will keep away, Garrett said. Bears and direwolves and and other things. So Waymar Sir Waymar's right <coughs> Sir Waymar's mouth became a hard line. No fire! Garrett's hood shadowed his face, but Will could see the hard glitter in his eyes as he stared at the knight. For a moment he was afraid the older man would go for his sword. It was a short, ugly thing, its grip discoloured by sweat, its edge nicked from hard use, but Will would not have, have given an iron bob for the lordling's life if Garrett pulled it from its scabbard. Finally, Garrett looked down. No fire, he muttered, low under his breath. Royce took it for acquiescence and turned away. Fucking hell. George, I forgot you put that in there. Fucking hell. Royce took it for acquiescence. Now, guys, you can see I can stumble through this here, but I know how the fuck to say acquiescence. Hey, 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 nice one. Lead on, he said to Will. Will threaded their Will threaded their way through a thicket, then started up a slope to the low ridge where he had found his vantage point under a sentinel tree. Under the thin crust of snow, the ground was damp and muddy. Slick footing, with rocks and hidden roots to trip you up. Will made no sound as he climbed. Behind him he heard the soft metallic slither of the lordling's ring meal. <coughs> the rustle of leaves and muttered curses as reaching branches grabbed at his long sword and tugged on his splendid sable cloak. The great, sentinels, the great sentinel was right there at the top of the ridge where Will had known it would be. Its lowest branches a bare foot off the ground. Will, sw sl Will slid in underneath, flat on his belly in the snow and the mud, and looked down on the empty clearing below. His, st his heart stopped in his chest. For a moment he dared not breathe. Moonlight shone down on the clearing, the ashes of the fire pit, the snow-covered lean-to, the great rock, the little half-frozen stream, Everything was just as it had been a few hours ago. They were gone. All the bodies were gone. Gods, he heard behind him. A sword sl slashed at a branch as Sir Weimar Royce gained the ridge. He stood bes beside the sentinel, long sword in hand, 
his cloak billowing behind him as the wind came up, outlined nobly against the stars for all to see. <clears throat> Get down, Will whispered urgently. Something's wrong. Royce did not move. He looked down at the empty clearing and laughed. Your dead men seem to have moved camp, Will. Will's voice abandoned him. He groped for words that did not come. It was not possible. His eye swept back and forth over the abandoned campsite, stopped in the axe, a huge double-bladed battle axe still lying where it, where he had last where he had seen it last, untouched, a valuable weapon. On your feet, Will, Sir Waymar commanded. There's no one here. I won't have you hiding under a bush. Reluctantly, Will obeyed. Sir Waymar looked at him with open disapproval. I'm not going. <coughs> I'm not going back to Castle Black of Failure on my first ranging. We will find these men. He glanced around. Up the tree. Be quick about it. Look for a fire. Will turned away, wordless. There was no use to argue. The wind was moving. It cut right through him. He went to the tree, a vaulting grey-green sentinel, and began to climb. Soon his hands were sticky with sap, and he was lost among the needles. Fear filled his gut, like a meal he could not digest. He whispered a prayer to the nameless gods of the wood, and slipped his dirk free of its sheath. He put it between his teeth to keep both hands free for climbing. The taste of cold iron in his mouth gave him comfort. Down below, the lordling called out suddenly. Who goes there? Will heard uncertainty in the challenge. He stopped climbing. He listened. He watched. The woods gave answer. The rustle of leaves. The icy rush of the stream. A distant hoot of a snow owl. The others made no sound. Will saw a movement from the corner of his eye. Pale shapes gliding through the wood. He turned his head, glimpsed a white shadow in the darkness. Then it was gone. Branches stirring gently in the wind, scratching at one another with wooden fingers. Will opened his mouth to call down a warning, and the words seemed to freeze in his throat. Perhaps he was wrong. Perhaps he had only seen a bird. A reflection on the snow. Some trick of the moonlight. What, what had he seen, after all? Will, are you there? Where are you? <clears throat> Sir Waymar called up. Can you see anything? He was turning in a slow circle, suddenly wary, his sword in his hand. He must have felt them, as Will felt them. There was nothing to see. Answer me! Why is it so cold? It was cold. Shivering, Will clung more tightly to his perch, his face pressed hard against the trunk of the sentinel. He could feel the sweet, sticky sap on his cheek. A shadow emerged from the dark of the wood. It stood in front of Royce, tall it was, and gaunt and hard as old bones, with flesh pale as milk. Its armour seemed to change colour as it moved. Here it was white as new fallen snow, there black as shadow, everywhere dabbled with the deep grey green of the trees. The patterns ran like moonlight on the water with every step it took. Wool heard the breath go out of Sir Weimar Royce in a long hiss. Come no father, the Lordling warned. His voice cracked like a boy's. He threw the long sable cloak back over his shoulders to free his arms for battle. He took his sword in both hands. The wind had stopped. It was very cold. The other slid forward on silent feet. In his hand was a long sword like, like none that Will had ever seen. No human metal had gone into the forging of that blade. It was alive with moonlight, translucent, 
a shard of crystal so thin that it seemed almost to vanish when seen edge on. There was a faint blue shimmer to the thing, a ghost light that played around its edges, and somehow Will knew it was sharper than any razor. Sir Waymar met him bravely. Dance with me then! He lifted his sword high over his head defiant. His hand trembled from the weight of it, or perhaps from the cold. Yet in that moment, Will thought he was a boy no longer, but a man of the night's watch. So there you, there you go. That's, that's actually really good. Will finally recognises Sir Waymar as a man of the night's watch because he's fucking facing off against that. Credit where credit's due. Fuck me. Right. Ah, oh, it's what a chapter, man. So good. The other halted. Will saw its eyes blue, deeper than bluer than any other human eyes, a blue that burned like ice. They fixed on the long sword trembling on high. Watched the moonlight running down the co running cold along the metal. For a heartbeat he dared to hope. They emerged silently from the shadows, twins to the first, three of them, four, five, Sir Waymar may have felt the cold came with them, but he never saw them, never heard them. Will had to call out it was his duty and his death if he did. He shivered and hugged the tree and kept the silence. The pale sword came shivering through the air, Sir Waymar met it with steel. When the blades met, there was no ring of metal on metal, only a high, thin sound at the edge of hearing, like an animal screaming in pain. Royce checked a second blow and a third, and then fell, ba fell back a step. Another flurry of blows, and he fell back again. Behind him, to the right, to the left, all around him, the watchers stood pa patient, faceless, silent. The shifting patterns patterns of their delicate armour making them all but invisible in the wood. Yet they made no move to interfere. Again and again the swords met until Will wanted to cover his ears against the strange anguished keening of their clash. Strange anguished keening of their clash? You, George spends a lot of time in a motherfucking dictionary. Sir Waymar was... <coughs> Sir Waymar was panting from the effort now, his breath steaming in the moonlight, his blade was white with frost, the others danced with pale blue light. Then Royce's parry came to a beat too late. The pale sword bit through the ring meal beneath his arm. The young lord cried out in pain. Blood welled between the rings. It steamed in the cold, and the droplets seemed red as fire as they touched the snow. Sir Waymar's fingers brushed his side. His moleskin glove came away, soaked with red. The other said something in a language that Will did not know. His voice was like the cracking of ice on a winter lake, and the words were mocking. Apparently it's scroth. is the language of the White Walkers, or the others. That screech that mimics breaking ice. Check it out now. We need drinky poos here. Sir Waymar Royce found his fury. For Robert! He shouted, and he came up snarling, lifting the frost covered longsword with both hands and swinging it around in a flat sidearm slash with all his weight behind it. The other's parry was almost lazy. When the blades touched, the steel shattered. A scream echoed through the forest night, and the long sword shivered into a hundred brittle pieces, the shards scattering like a rain of needles. Royce went to his knees, shrieking and covering his eyes. Blood welled between his fingers. The watchers moved forward <coughs> the watchers moved forward together as if some signal had been given. Swords rose and fell, all in deathly silence. It was cold butchery. The pale, 
the pale blades sliced through the ring mail as if they were silk. Wall closed his eyes. Far beneath him he heard the voices and laughter sharp as icicles. Fucking hell, man. That's, that's proper. Like, you know, it's pretty keep it different there than um, the show and stuff. Uh, so Waymarsh killed out, right? But this is like, you know, them gather, like, gathering around them, fucking laughing their balls off. <laughs> what they fucking do, man? When he found the courage to look again, a long time had passed and the ridge below was empty. He stayed in the tree, scarce, scarce daring to breathe, when the moon crept slowly across the black sky. Finally, his muscles cramping and his fingers numb with cold, he climbed down. Royce's body lay face down in the snow, one arm outflung. The thick sable cloak had been slashed in a dozen places. Lying dead like that, you saw how young he was, a boy. He found what was left of the sword a few feet away. The end splintered and twisted like a tree struck by lightning. Will knelt, looked around warily and snatched it up. The broken sword would be his proof. Garrett would know more of what to make of it. And if not him, then surely the, that old bear Mormont or Master Eamon. Would guard still be waiting with the horses? He had to hurry. Will rose. Sir Waymar Roy stood over him. His fine clothes were a tatter, his face a ruin. A shard from his sword transfixed the blind white pupil of his left eye. The, the right eye was open. The pupil burned blue. It saw. The broken sword fell from nerveless fingers. Will closed his eyes to pray. Long, elegant hands brushed his cheeks, then tightened around his throat. They were gloved in the finest moleskin and sticky with blood. Yet the touch was icy cold. Way fuck me, boys. Well, like, how the fuck was that not hooking you? How the fuck is that not hooking you? And uh, guys, if you haven't read the books, I would... Uh, you know, there's nothing like reading in your own imagination taking over. It really is fucking brilliant. Guys, thank you very much for joining me. Um, check out my other two videos. Like I said as well, don't forget to check out Bobby's reading of uh, Fire and Blood as well. Definitely pick up a copy of that recommend the hedge night to you as well there's loads of shit out there for you loads of shit out there right um guys as well um <clears throat> we have some exciting news coming up by the way don't forget to like share and subscribe to this fucking video i haven't even said that yet professional right don't forget to like share and subscribe um we have some really interesting stuff coming up on the channel as well uh merchandise well not really merchandise more You'll see. You'll fucking see what I'm talking about. But for now, guys, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Slancha, and I'll fucking see you next time to finish the video off. Uh, I'm going to finish this paint here. The North remembers.